Um, so those are the visual supports. I think I've said most of those. It does, it reduces their frustration. Um, oh, and another thing, really good thing about visuals, it helps with their vocabulary. So if you can imagine if you're learning another language um, and every time somebody says toilet in that language, they show you a picture of a toilet, you are likely to remember that word a lot more than you would if somebody was just saying it to you. Um, so it does, if we pair the words with the picture, it helps build on vocabulary. So by no means are we trying to replace words, replace spoken language with pictures. It, it really helps to build on spoken language as well. Um, and then the last component of the SLP programming in the classroom is the one-on-one -on -one SLP visits from myself or one of the other SLPs. Um, so if your child has mild moderate funding, I typically see them once every two weeks. And if they have have funding, then I'm there every week generally to see them in the school. So we always aim for our sessions to be as play-based as possible, fun and engaging so that they like it, that they want to come. Like we know 100% that children learn better and they learn best when they're having fun. Um, so that's always like our number one goal. And it's this is kind of our opportunity to introduce the skill that they need to work on, introduce the new skill, and then help them make sure that they're able to do the skill before we send them back into the classroom and expect them to practice that skill. So it gives us a chance to practice it over and over and over again in like a really intensive way, um, get as many repetitions as we can in that amount of time to make it much easier for the child to do it. And then in that way, they can then go back to the classroom and they'll be more able to transfer those skills into the classroom. Like as a really quick example, if they're having a really hard time at the beginning of the session saying the L sound, and it's like very effortful, they need a lot of support, like guiding me, telling them what to do. I want to get to the point where by the end of the session, it's much easier for them. It takes very little help from me so that when they go into the classroom, they're able to continue practicing getting better and better um, rather than reinforcing the old pattern that they're doing. So the one-on-one -on -one visits are really, really important too. Um, and in some cases we don't have one-on-one, -on -one. like if, if a child doesn't, if their goals, depending on what their needs are, sometimes we might think it's more beneficial to stay in the classroom instead of taking them out and we can work on like social interaction with their peers, like taking turns, sharing, that kind of thing. So um, it really depends on the child, but in any case we have one-on-one, -on -one, one, visits for one child where we're focused on one child at a time and we're thinking about what they need. Um, so we can go to, I guess, two slides ahead. So SLP support at home, I'll try to be really quickly. So this is um, what I would say first is that it's very important to know what your child is working on with their SLP. I know that you've probably seen the IPP with the goals, but on a more like day to day basis, you should be getting contact notes or some type of communication from your SLP. So try to be sure of what you're doing so that you can kind of be working on the same stuff at home. And if you're not sure what they're working on, just, just ask your SLP, they'll, be, they'll just be able to tell you easily. Um, I said it before, but repetition is really key. So children need to be exposed to a new word or a new concept or anything like that at least 15 times before they can actually learn it. And we know from evidence that children with language delays need it much more than 15 times. Like, maybe 30 times or more. Um, so we really do have to repeat things a lot in order for them to, to really acquire it. Um, so the, the, your SLP will send home ideas and send home homework and home practice, like maybe worksheets or cards to practice. So definitely give them a try if you can. And if, if you find that those are not working for your family, like there's just no way that you're gonna sit and help them do a worksheet or do cards with them for five minutes, then just let your SLP know and she could, or they can suggest maybe like a more play-based way of doing it or a different way that's more embedded into your day. So just let them know if you're finding their home practice difficult and they will definitely find an alternative. Um, I would say too, as parents, sometimes we kind of like ask our kids questions, we sort of drill them and say like, you try it, you try it. What I, what we want in this case is to just give them whatever they need when you're practicing for them to be successful. So provide them with a model, like you show them what you're expecting as many times as they need. You do it first and then they can copy you or you may feel that it's beneficial to even get down to their level, 
do it at the exact same time as them so that they can mirror your mouth. So if that's what they need, go ahead and do it. Don't worry about like, no, you have to do it on your own. Just our goal is for them to be successful. We don't want to kind of reinforce the error patterns. So rather than if, if you're working on grammar, rather than saying like, no, he didn't, he, what did he do? What did he do? Just model it for them and then they can repeat it if they want, but just really give them what they need to be successful when you're practicing speech and language goals. Um, so yeah, get down to their level. Even when you're doing not just speech, but any type of play or language, it really makes a big difference if you're eye to eye with them. Like you can see in this picture with the dad and his son, they are eye to eye. So that's like a perfect atmosphere for language interact, language back and forth. Um, they can watch your mouth, learn how you're saying those sounds. Like if, whenever possible, if you can be at their level, that makes a huge difference. Um, then I wrote use favorite, use their favorite books, games, and toys to work on any of their goals. So kids learn best when they're having fun. Um, so I would just say follow their lead completely. Like let them choose the activity and then you find a way to incorporate what they need to work on. So as an example, if they, if one of the things they're struggling with is pronouns, you could say, okay, which game do you want to play? They pick a game and then you just find a way to sort of bombard them with pronouns. Like you could say, I don't like that color. I want to be blue. I, and just over and over again in a different, with sort of different endings to your sentence, but you're just giving them tons of modeling of the pronoun that you want to hear. So you can do that with speech sounds, um, any type, anything that you're practicing, like whether it be prepositions, you're trying to clean up, you say in the box, put it in the box over and over again, tons of repetition, but use things that they like instead of forcing them to do an activity they don't want to do. So the next page has more ideas. I'll be really quick. Um, one of the things, and I know Shauna talked about this too, but a really great way to practice following directions is to do chores at home. So um, one of the best things that I, I see all the time is to follow recipes with your child. But I know that recipes, like for my own, the way I feel about it is that they're very messy and they take a long time and that's just it's probably not ideal but if you do want to do recipes you can look up child friendly recipes and they have pictures which would be awesome for a kid if somebody did was willing to put the time and effort into following recipe with them um but other chores you can do like one of the one that i really like is the laundry so you could take it out of the washing machine pass it to your young child they could put it in you could they could help you with pairing socks i know one of my sites yesterday the, the parents were saying that their daughter helps to always pair the socks when she does the laundry. So that's, those types of things are so great for them to following the proper order. Like we're taking it from here, but then we put it first, we take it out of the washing machine, then we put it in the dryer, um, helping you wipe the counter, use a dustpan and brush on the floor, like all sorts of things. Emptying the dishwasher is great because you can tell them where things go. You can say, put the spoon in that drawer, like they're having to listen and follow a direction. Watering plants is really great too. Um, it takes lots of steps. So first you have to fill up the watering can, then you have to find the plants and you have to wipe up the mess that you made. So there's lots of different parts to it. Um, again, like I said, offering choices whenever you can. I'm just gonna skip to the next one. This is a big one. So parents often say to me that their child struggles to answer when they say, how was your day or what did you do today? Um, so at this age, it's totally okay that they have trouble answering that question because it's really broad. There's a, they did a lot of things that day. It's very hard for them to answer that question with the language that a three, four or five year old has. So instead of those broad questions, try making them as specific as you can. So I gave some examples like, did you make a craft today? Did you go outside today? And then once they're able to answer that question, you can kind of build on it. So like, did you go outside today? If they say yes, you can say, oh, what did you play with outside? If they say, I went on the slide, you could say, oh, who did you go on the slide with? Like, you can start building more questions to get more information bit by bit, but just giving them like a really broad question is sort of, I mean, it's just, it's just too difficult for this age group. It's not them, it's just too difficult. Um, and then my last thing is that less is more. And I say this all the time, like whenever you can simplify your language at home, like if you get home and you say, okay, first I need you to take off your shoes and then go to the kitchen and, and wash your hands before we can eat dinner. Like if you give them this huge sentence, 
it's likely that they're not going to take it in. So try to take out any unnecessary words, make it very direct, concise, especially if you're giving them a direction that you want them to do. Um, so like an example here would be first take off your shoes, then wash your hands and do that whenever you can. It's also, it's, and probably everyone's had experience with this. It's very overwhelming when you're getting a lot of language at you. Like it's much more, I find this a lot when people are just all talking at me at once. It is overwhelming. It's much calmer for me and easier for me to process it. If people are saying less, if it's more direct, if it's slower, there's less words. Um, kids really benefit from that. And I think sometimes we forget that they are still learning language and they do need us to slow down and make it a little bit clearer for them. So I've written down here to visit Talkbox Alberta. I did put a link, but I don't think you're gonna be able to click it. So if you just Google Talkbox Alberta, it will come up. I really love this site. I've used it myself as a parent, um, just for information, like activities that you can do at home. Also tons of information about milestones, developmental milestones that we can expect at certain ages. Um, there's so many, it's, it can have, like, it can actually be very specific when you, you'll see there's super specific headings and it's in Alberta, which is, which is neat. So definitely check that out if you have time. And then the last two slides, which I don't need to go over, you can read on your own, on your own uh, if you need to. So I've just included the language milestones that we would expect for this age group. And then the next slide is the speech sound age norms that we would expect for certain ages. Um, and I will say with this, like it is important to know which sounds come at different ages, but it's not the only determining thing whether we work on it. So like if a child has multiple, multiple sounds that they need to work on, I'm not only gonna work on it if it's past the age that they should have it. Like I we would basically choose a sound that is most impacting their clarity and that will make the biggest difference if we fix it. Um, so sometimes what your, your SLP will be working on, you'll say like, oh, that's not, that does, that seems like he's, it's okay if he doesn't have that yet, but there's probably a reason that they are choosing that. Like, obviously we're not gonna work on the sound R with a three-year-old, that wouldn't be, that would just be really difficult for everyone. But um, like you may see that we'd be working on S or S blends when they're four, even though they are supposed to be getting it when they're four, if that makes sense. So this chart is like most kids when they're four have these sounds. Most kids by the time they're five have these sounds. It's not, it's definitely not they get these sounds when they're four and they get these sounds when they're five. It's that in general, they have them by that age. So um, that's everything for me.